We often teach best what we ourselves mostly need to learn. This is a quote dear to me that I want you to keep in mind throughout this video. I may be the voice that's narrating this video today and perhaps the voice to guide you through this emotional journey, but in no shape or form am I exempt from the challenges presented in this video. If anything, the very reason that I decided to take such a deep dive into this depressing and thought-provoking topic is because I've struggled with it for a long time. <laughs> Who am I kidding? I'm still battling with it and probably will always have a fight to pick with the opponent that is addiction that has been compromising my future. Going to be talking about addiction. About addiction. That my addiction manifests in other ways. Addiction. When the ordinary everyday escape mechanisms fail to satisfy, I plunge into my overtly addictive patterns. If I had greater pain and fewer resources, if I had been less fortunate in the circumstances of my nurturing environment, I might have been compelled to turn to some of the heaviest ones. But my addiction is my own. And fortunately for me, it's not the topic of today's video. So let's get to the study subject of this analysis. The Queen's Gambit follows the rise of Beth Harmon, played by Anya Taylor-Joy. The plot of the show is set in around the 1950s and 70s and tells a story of an orphan who eventually rises through the ranks of the male-dominated chess world. However, her rise to fame wasn't without bumps and bruises. We see her go through a lot in a span of just one season, and some of the challenges include fighting off a strong pill and alcohol addiction, as well as dealing with losing her mother and battling the trauma that came along with it. The numbers might have changed by the time you watch this, but as of writing this, The Queen's Gambit has been seen by over 70 million people since it was released in late October 2020 and broke a couple of previously held records on its arrival. I myself wasn't drawn to it immediately. I didn't understand the hype and the story sounded too simple to be interesting enough to watch, especially given that I never taken a real interest in chess. But eventually, after a couple of recommendations by some close friends, I gave in and I gave it a shot. Now, you, like I probably probably left the show very impressed or maybe you're one of the few who left the show feeling indifferent. Perhaps you haven't even watched it yet and just like I was before, you're still on the fence. Regardless of which side of the fence you find yourself on, I hope you're going to enjoy this video. Warning, this video contains spoilers. Another question that has been on many people's lips is, what's so special about The Queen's Gambit? It's a fair question and I've struggled to explain why I enjoy it so much, but an idea that I keep coming back to is that fundamentally people are drawn to storytelling, not just because stories entertain us, but because well-told stories convey important psychological truths in easily digestible formats that allow us to ponder and confront the darker truths of life. Whether that confrontation takes place in and around the campfire or through the safe confines of our living rooms, the fundamentals of what makes a story compelling and gripping hasn't changed. The well-written stories being told gives us truths that reaches beyond what we are taught in school or by our parents and momentarily allows us to see behind the decor and challenge our preconceived notions about ourselves and our surrounding and this show is filled with a lot of deep psychological lessons that pertains to relationship, self-mastery, childhood trauma and more importantly addiction. The show opens with a disorienting scene of a young woman seemingly at her worst, being woken by loud knocks by a hotel worker, signaling to the audience that she's clearly and frantically running late. She scrambles around her room to find a spare shoe, further depicting her disoriented state, as she reaches for a small bottle concealing a few pills which she quickly swallows. This is a glimpse of the future that shows us a well-accomplished, well-respected and well-put-together professional who by all means is expected to have her things together and be prepared for what seems to be a big occasion. But just like many people who struggle with addiction, what is seen on the outside isn't necessarily a true reflection of what is going on on the inside. Although we, the viewers, eventually get to see the character's life from a wider scope, very few people out there are aware that sometimes there is more than meets the eye. And there's actually such a thing as a high functioning addict and they exist everywhere. But of course, Beth's addiction problems doesn't begin here.
like many things that tend to have a traumatic nature, the source stems from the person's childhood. In Beth's case, the day she lost her mother, which then only got amplified the day she put her first step into the orphanage. Early on, we see the signs of a strong genetic basis of Beth's intelligence and resiliency at play. We find out that her mother was exceptionally gifted, earning a PhD in mathematics from Cornell. This trait is likely passed on to her daughter as we see that she finished her math test early, leading her teacher to ask her to clap chalk erasers in the basement with the remaining class time. It is through this act of helpfulness that Beth discovers Mr. Shabold, a janitor at the orphanage, and gets her first glimpse of chess. The following day, she returns to Mr. Shabold, asking him to teach her how to play, which he stubbornly refuses. Luckily, this didn't turn out to be a classical case of man in power using and abusing a young and vulnerable girl. Instead, as Shabold gradually opened up to Beth, we got a fruitful mentee and mentor relationship, but also an introduction to Beth's first addictions, which she obtains through chess. This is where I believe I'm going to divide the audience, but I count chess as one of her addictions. When suffering a traumatic event, we sometimes turn to an activity that can serve as an outlet for the pain we secretly carry within us. Knowing that an idle mind is the devil's playground, we dread any moment alone with our own thoughts and instead we jump head first into our work, side projects, sports activities, or in Beth's case, chess. For me, it used to be reading. I always had a book in my pocket as an emergency kit in case I was ever trapped waiting anywhere. Even for one minute. Be it in the line at the local coffee shop or the supermarket checkout queue, I was forever throwing my mind scraps to feed on as to a ferocious mm -hmm. and malevolent beast that would devour me the moment you wasn't chewing on something else. We see the same pattern take place in Beth's life where the pain caused by losing her mother, being the new kid at the foster school and all the struggles that goes along with it gets pushed away momentarily when she indulges her mind in the novelties and complexities of chess. It's an entire world of just 64 squares. I feel safe in it. I can control it. I can dominate it. Well, creativity and psychosis often go hand in hand. In the world of chess, she sees her opportunity to get a fresh start and recreate her self-image by channeling her natural intelligence and resilience to manipulate the pieces on the board to bend to her will. Interestingly enough, resilient children have been found to be better at concentrating on their work and possess better reasoning and reading skill than their less resilient counterparts, which partly explains why Beth had such a knack for chess. As Beth's chess skills increases, so does her need of control. It becomes more than just a game. It becomes an obsession. We see this as well when the headmistress, instead of punishing Beth for ditching class to play chess, rewards her with the opportunity to play it more. Through her chess skills, she's gaining more power and influence that feeds on itself and eventually takes over her entire mind. Many of the world's most powerful people fit this profile. A number of them were neglected or powerless when they were young, and their strive to dominate can be viewed as a way for them to ensure that they will never be in such a vulnerable situation again. However, I can see how it may become difficult to understand how someone might become addicted to an activity. It is helpful to recognize that people do not actually become addicted to a substance or a behavior in itself. Instead, people become addicted to the effect of those substances or behaviors effect on the brain. From this slightly more accurate perspective, it becomes easier to understand how activities can become addictive. This is because certain activities create a chemical effect in the brain that is very similar to the abuse of drugs. Therefore, while some addictions occur because substances are added to the body that alter the brain's functioning, certain activities can achieve a similar effect. These activities alter brain chemistry in the same way addictive substances do. But to fully grasp this habit-forming loop that is addiction, we might have to quickly go through the basic understanding of what it means. According to a well-written article published in Psychology Today, a person with an addiction uses a substance or engages in a behavior for which the rewarding effects provides a compelling incentive to repeat the activity, despite detrimental consequences. Addiction in this sense may involve the use of substances such as alcohol, inhalants, opioids, cocaine, and nicotine, or behaviors akin to gambling. The same article also states that there is evidence that addictive behaviors share key neurobiological features. These neurobiological features involve brain pathways of reward and reinforcement which necessitate the neurotransmitter dopamine and combined with highly motivated states they lead to the elimination of synapses in the prefrontal cortex home of the brain's highest functions so that attention instead is highly focused on cues related to the target substance or activity because addiction affects the brain's executive functions centered in the prefrontal cortex individuals who develop an addiction may not be aware that their behavior is causing problems for themselves and others instead they may resort to self 
deception and claim that the behaviors exhibited are by their own will or worse, that they have complete control over them, when in reality, yeah, you've all heard or seen the outcome of this before. This is well depicted by Beth's adoptive mother, Alma, who struggles with alcohol addiction. Although Alma don't seem like your typical drunk, it is strongly implied that she has struggled with alcoholism for a long time. For instance, at one point, Alma's husband tells her to get him a beer, but added if there's any left, implying that she might have drank them all. And during dinner time at some point in episode 3, Beth kindly suggests that maybe it was the alcohol causing Alma to get sick all the time, and Alma responded that she's been flirting with alcohol for a long time. Alma eventually starts letting Beth drink with her, as life is not all about chess. And by many people, she might be seen as right here, trying to get Beth to be more social. But at the same time, we must also remember that Beth is only a teenager during this point. And given the context, it doesn't really seem like she's looking to celebrate with her daughter, but more so that she's an addict trying to play off her addiction by portraying it as her having a drinking buddy. This is a very common addict mentality, by reframing it that if the addict isn't using alone, it becomes a social situation and thus it's okay for the addict to consume the drug in question despite them doing it almost every day by themselves. And through her lack of self-awareness, Alma passes on this addiction to Beth who initially sees the potential negative consequences of it but eventually also gets sucked into it. And over time, the pursuit of the pleasurable effects of the substance or behavior may dominate an individual's activities and sadly, in some cases, lead to the person's own death, both figurative or literal. I'd also love to point out that the line where Beth said to her kid opponent, after you become world champion, what will you do next for the rest of your life, shows that Beth actually learned from her stepmother by seeing a younger version of herself through the kid that life isn't all about chess. But coming to that realization had a very steep price for Beth. And sometimes that is the flip coin of addiction, especially when the gateway of that said addiction is aided by someone whom one loves, admires, and trusts. The root cause of Beth's addiction stems from the trauma that she accumulated during her formative years. A common theme surrounding her trauma pertains to the lack of control she has had over very significant events. Her mother's death, her father's absence, and being placed in a foster home, then later being adopted by a dysfunctional family. However, as the story goes, she finds a way of escaping it. First, by immersing herself in the world of chess, which in itself is akin to a spiritual practice, but also through her introduction to alcohol and cigarettes, which helps her momentarily soothe and drown her depression so that she can feel whole and happy for the period that it lasts. Quite early on in the series, Beth meets an older girl at a foster home named Jolene. Jolene, a slightly older and more experienced orphan, informs Beth about the pills that are freely being handed out by the staff at the foster home in order to calm down the girls. Jolene also warns Beth about the pills addictive nature and suggests to Beth that if she is to take them, the ideal time is to wait until bedtime in order to make it easier to fall asleep. Having no reason to doubt her new acquired friend Jolene, Beth follows suit and takes quickly to these pills, which shortly after leads to her experiencing strong hallucinations. These hallucinations helps her better visualize the chess moves that Mr. Shabel taught her in the basement. Taking a liking to the hallucinating trips she goes on every night, she develops an obsession that eventually leads to an addiction to them and starts to hide the pills in her toothbrush cup for a few days before taking what seems to be like three or five pills at the same time before bedtime. This is what some medical experts would call a quiet tolerance and now Beth must take more pills to get the feeling she originally got from just one. To make matters worse, around this time we are informed that due to state laws, the orphanage can no longer supply the tranquilizers to the children. Beth's pill addiction eventually reaches an all-time low when she comically gets caught for sneaking into the medical room to steal as many pills as she can fit into her tiny dress pockets. Personally, I thought it was a good way of showing addiction. All the plotting and scheming to get your fix, but then when it's right there in front of you, and especially if suffering withdrawals, good sense goes out of the window and you throw caution to the wind. It's unfortunately one of the reason so many addicts die by misadventure. Sustained controlled use of a substance for a true addict is extremely difficult, which is why most recovery programs often recommend total abstinence. Controlled use is like an attractive myth which many addicts will fall for, 
which then more often than not leads to relapsing. However, the relapse or for a lack of a better word, lack of control and Beth's personal journey of eventually regaining her autonomy is something that is beautifully portrayed and symbolized throughout the entire show. For example, in the minute details pertaining to her style of clothes, Whenever she is in a certain stage of her maturation, her clothes reflect that, and as her character profile progresses and becomes more defined, so does her sense of style. Beth's personal style is a symbolism of her regaining the control of the metaphorical steering wheel and becoming a fully-fledged autonomous being who finally can decide and be responsible for her own actions. But I'm that gawky kid who kicked my ass five years ago. <laughs> Apparently she grew up. And in the final part of the series, after she manages to beat Borgov, her character growth is beautifully portrayed by her outfit, where she's dressed in all white with a little hexagonal hat with a poof, signaling that she's finally coming into her own. She's the queen of chess, figuratively and literally. I may have just played the best chess player of my life. In the second half of the show, we get to see a side of Beth's addiction that I particularly remembered well due to how well it was portrayed. Beth is presumably high on drugs and is having a solo downfall while she's dancing in her living room. It's a real solo pity party that I believe a lot of addicts can relate to in some way or another. We've fully accepted the absolute tragedy of our actions, but we can't help ourselves from just enjoying our high and ignoring the immediate consequences. So we block everything out and try to rationalize how sweet the fruit roots of our addictions are to our deprived souls. Addiction brings a certain loneliness and shame. And if one could help it, no one would ever be allowed to see us in that state because, let's face it, it's quite pathetic. So we're left all by ourselves in our own amusement and the only companions is our drugs of choice. Alcohol, pills, inhalants, work, porn, sex. And there we are, just like Beth, spinning in circles mentally checking out of our bodies, believing that it's leading us somewhere, until we realize that it doesn't. But at this point, we don't know how to stop. You always drink this much? Sometimes I drink more. With Beth, we can see how her past failures and unresolved childhood trauma creeps back into her mind as soon as the high of the drug starts to wear off. Early exposure to significant adverse experience can contribute to the development of substance use disorder by overwhelming an individual's coping ability by either sensitizing brain pathways of alarm and distress or by adding to the burden of pressure. Both substance use disorders and gambling behaviors have an increased likelihood of being accompanied by mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety. Substance use and gambling disorders are complex conditions that affect the reward, reinforcement, motivation and memory systems of the brain. They are characterized by social impairment, involving the disruption of everyday activities and trust-broken relationships. In Beth's case, it is that look that is all too familiar at the latter half of the series, a look of craving which signals that the brain might be consumed by its addiction. For example, when she's in Mexico and the endless array of wine bottles keep coming in and out of her hotel room, you can tell that she knows that she shouldn't, but deep inside, she really wants them. Which brings us to the next question. Many people still think that if a person wants to stop using a substance, a behavior or a way of thinking, they can just will it to happen. Well, if that was the case, addiction would not be such a global issue. If we think about it, those people who you or I may call or consider addicts have very strong wills. They go to almost any lengths to make sure that they get their chemical or find a way to act out their addictive behavior of choice. With Beth, we see her go through the trouble of scheming and manipulating the local pharmacist multiple times to hand out prescription pills. As time goes on, the seemingly innocent deceptive acts develops into elaborate plans on how to steal money from her adoptive mother to purchase alcohol, tobacco products and illicit drugs. These examples may sound rough and harsh when speaking about such a likable person as Beth, but these are the same things we see the shunned addicts of our society do to keep fueling their addictions as well. The effort of hiding, sneaking and keeping secrets also takes a whole bunch of willpower which Beth exerted and maintained throughout her entire period of her adolescence. So, in a way of looking at it, one could rephrase the question and ask ourselves, do addicts really lack willpower? Or do they simply have too much of it? I'll leave that on to all of you in the comment section to decide. 
There are many different routes to recovery. One step to getting on the right track is learning how to say no to the so-called friends who only calls you to get messed up together with you. It's another form of addiction. In the latter stages of the series, Beth gets acquainted with a mysterious industry girl who works as a model and is a friend of Benny Watts. This girl, whose name is Cleo, exemplifies the sort of people one meets in a phase of active addiction. Cleo exudes a certain allure and attractiveness as she's constantly going around the world and partying. She is the Instagram girl of our time, the type of girl who lives her best life online and makes sure that all one sees is her highlights of lavish spending and living. The addict might think, wow, I wish my life could be as exciting as hers. They seem so cool and interesting at the start never in one place, always partying, eating lavish food or catching planes. But when you look at it, when you actually look at it, their lives tend to be quite shallow, empty, and often they're totally unreliable and they don't have any respect for your achievements or goals. In fact, on some level, they want to sabotage other people's achievements due to jealousy or the desire to have friends with them down in the gutter to drink, smoke and party with, never growing or changing, only stuck in endless cycle of using and consuming. We see this between Cleo and Beth when Cleo, in quotation marks, randomly shows up just the night before Beth's biggest game of her life and asks her to get a drink with her. Knowing that Beth has an alcohol addiction and needs to rest and prepare for the next day. People like Cleo are the kind of people who are the most dangerous to a newly recovering addict like Beth. Getting back to the topic of the long road to recovery. The road to recovery is seldom straight. Relapse or recurrence of substance use is common, but definitely not the end of the road. For those who achieve the remission of addiction disorder for five years, researchers report the likelihood of relapse is no greater than that among the general population. Neuroscientists report that synaptic density is gradually restored over time and therefore needs a safe support structure around the addict in order for the synapses to strengthen and heal. In Beth, we see her coming to terms with the need of opening up and relying on the well-meaning of the people in her life. Beth has understandable trust issues, but the universe as portrayed by the writers of The Queen's Gambit reminds us that the world isn't necessarily a hostile place. It tends to reward resilience, competence, initiative and personal connection. Beth is luckily surrounded by people like Jolene and Harry Beltic who provides her with the much needed support and reminds Beth that there is a whole world out there that also belongs to her that doesn't revolve around chess. Slowly but surely, Beth transforms her relationship to her addiction. She becomes more intimately related to it. She even starts to gain a mastery over it, which means noticing it without allowing it to control her moods or behaviors. Excuse you, Harmon. Fuck you, Margaret. Beth realizes that she doesn't have to take on the impossible task of erasing the addictive impulses that arose from her early acquired brain patterns. Instead, she can transform her relationship to them. And the essential part to any such transformation is letting go of judgment and self-condemnation. Finally, it is impossible to understand addiction without asking what relief the addict finds or hopes to find in the drug or the addictive behavior. So. After analyzing Beth, I hope the question we ask ourselves from now on is not why the addiction, but why the pain. To summarize my analysis, despite the traumas Beth suffers and her ineffective coping through substance abuse, she ultimately prevails through specific attributes with a strong genetic basis, strong relational ties, and a support system who affirms and rewards her abilities. But we also learn that one, heroes are flawed people. Human beings tend to idolize their heroes, expecting them to be perfect in every way. We know, of course, that heroes are flawed, troubled, and suffering just like every other person. Beth Harmon has anger, anxiety, and trouble with intimacy. She also emotionally shuts down. What sets heroes apart is their ability to transform themselves and commit to their own personal growth. Mr. Shabel, her mentor, taught her this in fact. 2. The real enemy is usually in the mirror. People can be their own worst enemies. Beth competes in the chess world, but her most formidable opponent is herself. She struggles with a deep dependency on tranquilizers and alcohol. Even worse, she falsely believes that these drugs helps her win chess games. Beth's story tells us when life deals us blows, we must take a personal inventory to see to what extent we are responsible for our own misery. 3. We need friends. Mentorship is not enough. Beth's beauty, 
charm and skills endeared her to other chess players whom she defeated. They become her friends who rally behind her in helping her to defeat Borgo, the Russian world champion. The hero's journey is never meant to be undertaken alone. All heroes, from Thomas Shelby to Katniss Everdeen, need help from friends from time to time. Hey guys, I just wanted to leave you a quick message. If you enjoy my content and want to explore this particular topic further, there are two books that I've used as resources to make this video. They're both available as audiobooks if you prefer that. The first one is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghost by Dr. Gabor Mate, which goes in great depth of what addiction is and how to transform your relationship to it. It is a great read for anyone who's interested in psychology behind drugs, pills, inhalant addictions, as well as sex and masturbation addiction. The second book is Unwanted by Jay Stringer, which is a book that explores the why behind self-destructive sexual choices. The book is based on research from over 3,800 men and women seeking freedom from unwanted sexual behavior, be that the use of pornography, an affair, or buying sex. Both books has contributed a lot to this analysis, and I hope it shows that I pour my heart into every single video I make for you guys. I read articles, studies, books, to prepare myself the best as I can, but the flip side is that I make next to no money from doing this. It's just a hobby. So I figured if you want to support the channel while you invest in something that you enjoy, I'd appreciate if you used one of my affiliate links if you considered reading any of these two books. And that's the only thing that I wanted to ask from you guys. I'm sure I haven't captured every traumatic aspect of Beth's upbringing and psychological profile, and there's probably a bunch of you who don't agree with my analysis. That's completely fine. Whether you disagree with me or not, I'd still like for you to like or dislike the video and write down your thoughts or phrase your own analysis down below and let's have a discussion about it. Also, if you have seen this show already, don't forget to comment what your favorite Beth moment or quote is. With that being said, if you like these type of videos, be sure to like the video and subscribe. Peace.